chats with people in the role today because, well, he's absolutely right about the language. We can capture ideas and themes and, and philosophies and difference in terms of phraseology, how we talk, how we think, how we describe things. So I want to describe two ways we could be running um, Britain, Scotland, whatever else we want to be talking about. One of them says, worship the wealth creators. There are those people who are better than the rest of us. We know they're better than the rest of us because they've got a measure to show that they're better than the rest of us, and that's they've got money. They've generated money or they've managed to keep it. That makes them better, therefore they know how to run things, therefore we should stay out of the way, let them run the country, and all will be well. That's one possibility. Or I'll let me another one. To, to build more, we must share more. That actually, if you want to build things and develop things, the best way is to be in a situation of perpetual conflict and competition, but actually mutually working towards shared goals isn't only theoretically better, it's measurably and demonstrably better way to run a society. Now, the first of those is the absolutely overwhelming UK orthodoxy. The latter was the response of the Norwegian Prime Minister to the question of how to deal with recession. Now, I was talking, I've been talking so many books about this recently, and I've said in a few in which way to run a country, but yet find anybody who thinks that the wealth creators have got it right. So my question is, why are we not really in a position to make that choice? Why is it, despite the fact that, okay, there's a certain kind of audience I'm usually invited to talk to, but there's quite a lot of them, why have they not got a serious choice to choose that direction for their country? And that's because our political frameworks have been not accidentally damaged, but absolutely intentionally damaged. The group I was talking to yesterday was the EIS, with 100 teachers in a room talking about a wide range of issues. And I asked them a question, which was, how have we ended up with a politics, a political framework in which you're kept in a box, you'd like to talk about school exams, you'd like to moan about your salaries, but despite the fact that the real problems that face the education system are not problems of education, they're problems of society, which in fact are really problems of the economy, why are you not allowed to talk about that? Why is it that the EIS is never invited to a parliamentary committee to talk about economics, and yet the CBI, they don't think twice about publishing a paper on education. They've been in front of the Education um, Committee of the Scottish Parliament many times. The answer is, they've got a framework that works for them. It's called neoliberalism. We all know what it is. We can describe it in many ways. Um, but their framework works for them because they're the gatekeepers to the meaning of what is society, what is politics, and what is good governance. We have to change that. It is absolutely ridiculous. It has physically demonstrably failed, and it is absolutely not fixing its own failure and here it's getting worse. We, we can see this quite clearly. So where's our thing? Why have we not got this together? Because there are some choices. Um, anything I say today about political parties, I exclude the Greens. They've done wonderful work, serious, general thinking work about an alternative direction. Um, and yet, we're not seeing that change. And the answer is that the left, the progressive left, whatever we're going to call it, has been really woeful at the business of defining the meaning of politics and the meaning of society. We got bounced into a ghetto of protest and complaint and antiness. This is not a, a, a lexicon, this is not a, 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 a way to express ourselves which is never going to recapture um, this society on our behalf and we have to do something else. And the thing that's crazy is that, I mean, it takes about, seriously, take a shot in your groups, it takes about 20 minutes, you'll work out what's wrong in 20 minutes. And by the second you work out what's wrong, you'll fix it in 20 minutes, just in your head. It's very straightforward. We are just developing a program of action which was Based around the question, how would you become Nordic? If you started from where you are, how would you become a Nordic society? Because nobody's actually done it apart from the, the Nordic countries which did it in one historical context. Now, the UK standard belief in this is that there is just something strange about Scandinavians. Possibly all that oily fish that affects the brains. They are an exceptional group of people. We shouldn't really pay any attention to them. They are the exception that proves that the markets are the only way to run the world. Well, that's obviously rubbish. So we sat down with a group of economists in a, a number of high-level political meetings in Scotland, and we said, how would you become more Nordic? And we've got a like, very like, like basic six steps. The form of finance, the form of tax, the form of welfare, I mean, the expansion of and the recreation of welfare. 
the reform of the ownership of enterprise, the diversification of the economy, and the real genuine um, embedding of participative democracy through decision making. These things will move us rapidly towards the kind of country that we want to have. We know what's wrong, we know what we need to do, so what's the problem? The problem is we're all in a box. We do not have a framework for pulling this, pulling politics to us, and that's what we've been missing, that's what we've been failing. Because we've allowed the rhetoric, the beliefs, the language of neoliberalism to have us isolated and fragmented, we've not been able to do anything. And so, what the Reed Foundation, one of the things the Reed Foundation is trying to bring to this is good old-fashioned political strategy. It works for them, it should work for us. If anyone thinks anything I'm about to say is cynical, I apologise, but cynicism sometimes is what you really need to get places. We need a brand, we need a phrase, we need a way to describe this thing that we basically all agree about in a way that others can understand. We've got, I mean, this work, I can't talk about policy work, there's so much as unbelievable. There's literally dozens and dozens and dozens of leading academics working on policy work for us across the full spectrum of what would a good Scotland look like. But one of the, um, one of the things that we've also been working with is language people, words people. And a group of Scottish novelists, writers and others, and we said to them, what would you call this? We would need to say, this is a binary debate, and this is a big strategy here. This is no longer versions of neoliberalism. There are two options. There are a binary choice here. So, to make a binary choice, we need a name so people can see that other choice. And the phrase that we said, something distinctive, something Scottish, and something that reflects the meaning of what we're talking about. And they all came back, all of them came back and said, common meal. That's the phrase, that's the term that reflects shared wealth in common and the common pursuit of the well-being of all. The common meal is the way to go, is the, the phrase already used. So that's what we're doing. We're, we're running a very major project which we'll launch hopefully next week and week after. Um, and we're just going to open up the debate to anyone who wants to submit ideas and put them in. Uh, I, I would love to talk to people about the range of things that we can do. There's one last message, well let's just give you my kick. There's one last message which I do also want to point out to this one. The reaction we've had to come meals way beyond anything I've experienced in any politics I've ever been involved with in 20 years. We are getting contact from all over the place. In fact, I need people to stop the news so people can work them. But one of the most encouraging things that happened so far is the amount of contact from overseas. A group of radical uh, American economists, an eminent American economist, said, we saw this in the newspapers, which is one of the wonderful things about the internet. Can we help? This is really exciting. Scotland could be like a little test date to try some of this stuff out because you're in a particular time and a place and position where whatever the constitutional outcome, we are allowed to rethink society as if we were inventing it from scratch. So what I want to say about this is we are all engaged in a really, really useful project which we want to open out to everybody, bring everybody in. Common Deal isn't an idea that's owned by anyone. And we're bringing people from around the world in. So this is my last message. It would be a terrible shame if those of our friends who feel like us from the other side of the Atlantic can engage and our friends from the other side of the border don't. Scotland right now is a chance to shine a light on an alternative possibility for more than us. If we can be the first country that moves towards being Norway, we can generate a lesson for many people here and abroad. This is a big and important project and I hope everybody in here will send in their thoughts and their ideas for how we do this when we launch this project. Thanks.